of your will, your work, and your word. Thank you for the opportunity, God, we have once again to hear what you have to say to the church. As a result of what you speak, it becomes our responsibility to act. Word of God said, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so we ask you to help us, O oh Lord, to be better than we were yesterday. And to be even better tomorrow. For we are constantly becoming what we are. All because of what you did for us. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, amen. How many need the Lord right away? Oh, uh, yeah. I tell you, when you need the Lord, you want him to hurry up, don't you? Uh, Y'all don't have to be bashful. I don't know about you. I want the Lord to come quick. Amen. But I am old enough and mature enough that he only come when he's ready to come. So I got to maintain, the Bible teaches us to endeavor to keep the unity of the faith and the bond of peace. We oftentimes stray because we're impatient with God. Ah, that don't get you no brownie points. As a matter of fact, it'll cause you much anxiety because the thing I know about God, he don't change. You know, he's not going to change for you, and he's not going to change for me. So he's the same yesterday and today. Somebody say amen. amen. Bless the Lord. Give God some praise in this place. Thank God for our praise team. Amen. Very interesting passage of scripture here. We want to just take a little time to just try and encourage your hearts in this passage. It's a great passage. It's a good, it's a good text uh, here that Paul writes. Oft time, this text is uh, talked about often at funerals. This is a this is a text for courage. It's a text for courage because we are constantly at war with the three dimensional battlegrounds of the enemy. Battlegrounds of the church, battlegrounds of the mind, and the battlegrounds of the air. And because of that constant war, which is often subtle, in other words, if I was fighting physically with someone, I kind of know what to expect and know how to guard myself. But the Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We'll wrestle them against spiritual things, war, dark places, high, high things. We are wrestling in, in a battlefield that is not tangible. And so here what Paul says, he said, he says in this, in this text, particularly verse 6 and 8, therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say. Anytime you find Paul talking like this, even Jesus is to put emphasis on the action. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I want to talk about... How to, how to tackle life with confidence. How to deal with life with confidence. With confidence. <clears throat> Thank you for, I, I, think, I think the ministry and the guys helped for the last week, uh, somewhat under the weather, I don't know what to call it, it was something, and it had to be something if it kept me from the pulpit, because I, I don't like missing the pulpit, but um, um, I tried, and uh, it, 
was wise. So thank you for, enough, for supporting the church, and thank you for what is going on. And uh, feel much better, thank God. For, for, for this particular text, <clears throat> if you go down to your local bookstore, you could find uh, in your shopping books that would contain subject matters such as this. Confidence. How winning streaks and losing streaks begins and ends. How to develop confidence in influence of people. Ultimate secrets of total self-confidence. The confident woman raising confident boys, raising confidence girls, confident girls. Ten Days to More Confident, Public Speaking, A Guide to Confident Living, A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Building a Confident Life, A Bomb Proof, he said, Bomb Proof Your Life, Teach Your Horse to Be Confident. These are books, I ain't playing. <laughs> Obedience and safe, no matter what you encounter. Well, I'm making a point that there is on the bookshelves, you can find something for everything. Uh, all of us want to tackle life with confidence. We want, we want that for ourselves and for our children, our students, even our homes. We want confidence. Well, if you want to know the ultimate secret to confidence, uh, let's look at this text because it does speak to you, particularly the Christian, how to be confident. The word confidence, uh, it means to exercise courage. You, you, uh, when, you are, when you are facing uh, apprehensions and fears because of unexpected uh, circumstances that might lie ahead in your life, uh, you have to exercise. You have to perform courage, no matter what it is. Remind me that how Peter's faith was so that he stepped out on water and walked to Jesus, but he lost that faith when he saw the wind and the waves. Without realizing that the same faith was there that took him from the beginning to the end of his journey. Somehow he stopped exercising faith. Oft time the church, by the Christ, do that. In our early upstarts, when things are going well, we are running with confidence, but trouble tend to toss us, cause us to fail. We lose heart. Remind me of David when he had been to war, had major victories, come back home, found out the enemy has taken his family and the soldier's family, and they upset with David. But David went to the house of God, and he put on the ephod, talked to the Lord, and said, Lord, what shall I do? The Bible tells me that David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, shall I go get him, or shall I delay? God said, go get him. And see, sometimes you got to understand that courage can make the difference between your life, your neighbor's life, your family's life, right. your business life. Right. Courage don't mean necessarily that I have to act. 
outside of God's will. I don't have to get courage and want to fight because our battle is not with flesh and blood. Sometimes meekness is power. Sometimes we have to back off the wind. Sometimes we have to let God fight our battle. Sometimes you just need to let God do his thing while you sit your thing down. Takes a lot of courage. But here the text helps us to see that Paul uses the word confident and, confident and confidence 12 times here in this text. He's a man who has, has been rejected. He's a man who had been ridiculed. He's a man who had been beaten. He's a man who had been battered. He's a man who had been criticized. He has men who had been validified and left for dead. But he said something here that sounds great courageous in spite of all he'd been through and all his ministry for Christ and all that he suffered. He says, I know. <laughs> you didn't get it. You didn't get it. He, he, he says in this text, he said, I know. He said, I don't guess. I'm not guessing. It's no guessing game. I know. I intuitively know. And when it comes to who you are in Christ, you got to know that you know that you know that you're a child of God. You can't be going around here guessing this thing. Paul said, I know. What do you know, Paul? I know for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Now, first of all, Paul puts it in perspective. And very quickly, he put confidence in a couple of things that I think that if we're going to talk about being a Christian, what kind of courage shall I have? Well, the courage of a Christian is this. We must have confidence in the fact that we can think of a great deal about heaven. Uh -huh, I knew you weren't looking for that one. See, see, Christians got to have a confidence about what they believe about going to heaven. See, see, I, I, there are too many variables, there are too many issues, there are too many things in life that I, that I cannot trust. There are too many things that will not that you are not going to be able to trust. But the one thing that you got to know, you know, you know. If you can get that thing about heaven down straight, you can conduct yourself in a manner that will not allow you to be defray or to be, be deterred. That means that even in my suffering, even in that which is broken down in me, that which I'm able to accomplish, if I know that heaven is my destination and that it's a guarantee my ticket is paid and ain't nothing the devil in the hell can do anything about it, you can have some courage. Watch what Paul said. Paul says, I, I found out that when this old earthly house, when you talk about earthly house, what he's talking about is this tabernacle. He said, he said this body, when this old body, if this old earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he said, I know I'm living right now, but just in case. And, and he used language to catch you to let you know that he's not, he is not so, so confident about being on this side of eternity. For he calls his, his body this tabernacle. He said that for a reason, is that coincidental? He said tabernacle because when a, when a, when a company in the, old, in, the, in the days of the desert, when they move, a tabernacle was a tent. And then sometime God tell you to move. I, I wish I had so God said, you got to get up and go here. You, you know what God told Moses. He, he, he led them with a pillar, a cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. They move a little, and they set the tent up again, and they move a little, and they set the tent up again. They move a little, and they set the tent up again. Some of us have experienced moving in your own life. 
So Paul said, why since I am a Christian do I need to abandon the concept of moving? The old folk put it, old, put it this way. This old world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim traveling through this barren land. And if you're going to be a Christian, you got to have the attitude that heaven is my goal. Got to keep on moving. So he says, first of all, I got confidence because of the fact that if I decide to move, if I'm moving, if God called my name 10 seconds from the right now, that I'm confident that I got a place to go. <laughs> I wish I had somebody. See, folk who don't know that they got a place to go ain't confident about that thing. That's why people are still wondering if they save or not save. I don't know what I'm saying. Or do I not say? Am I not saved? But you better get it right because you got to have the courage to know that absent from the body is present with the Lord. You got to go somewhere. My grandmama said, You got to left here. You got somewhere to go. It's wonderful to know that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. A many mentioned, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself in that where I am. There you may be also. Paul said, I know something about heaven. He said, I know something about heaven. It's a good direct continuation of the previous paragraph. You, you have to look at it because even though it's broken down, it's actually referring to the previous paragraph about faithful ministry, trouble on every side, yet not distress. We are perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. See, you got to know something about confidence in case you get knocked out. Paul said, you can't knock me out. You may knock me down. But I got enough courage in me. Even Mike Tyson ain't going to knock me to the point where I can't get up. We fall down, but we get up. We are not a defeated foe. Get it in your life. Since you have become a child of God, you are a courageous individual. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can face your trouble. You can face your trial. You can face your difficulty. You can face your circumstances. Stand therefore in the name of Jesus. Get up. Pick up your head. Lift up your head. Don't you fall down. Don't you lose your, don't hang your head in shame. You're a child of God. You're somebody. So Paul said, I know. I know. He, said, he, he said, I know, but he said, we know. In other words, you got to come on celebrate with me because, see, Paul ain't known this thing by himself. It's us. We know. Somebody in here say, I know. He, and then watch what he does with this confidence about heaven. He great, this confidence about heaven. He said, for in this we groan earnestly designed to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He said, he said, in this tabernacle we groan. Come on, stay with me. Just stick with me. I, I, I hurry up my points. You are ready early. You are ready early. He said, in this life we have some ups and downs. He said, I, I'm, I'm, I get burning sometimes. But my burning is not that I want to be unclothed. That's why they say stuff like this. Weeping may do it for a night. But joy come in the morning. That, that's a saint who has a perspective on heaven. Trouble don't last. Always. Now it could be I have trouble the rest of my life, but the fact is that I don't desire to be unclothed, but I desire to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. 
He said, we grown in this tabernacle. Ain't no you trying to kid yourself. We do have trouble. Welcome to trouble. You can't psychologically dismiss it. You can't therapeutically dismiss it. You got to face it. But you face it with courage, with confidence, knowing that I got somewhere to go just in case I have to check out. Y'all ain't talking to me. So he said, we said, he said, he said, we are confident. He said, I have to deal with that. He said, I have to deal with it. So, so we fix our eye on what is not seen. Look at the text up in verse, uh, look at chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why is that? For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He said no matter what the affliction, no matter what the trouble, said it ain't always be like that. He's, I see, I feel. I feel the trouble. I feel the complexity. I feel the dilemma. I feel the pressure. He says something about the fact when you look at it. He says, for our light affliction. You see verse 17? He says, how are you going to call my affliction light? You don't know what I'm going through. Pay attention to the text. For our light of fiction, which is but for a moment. And whatever you're going through, you can say, I've been going through for 15 years. But in God's, uh, God's eyes, it's only seconds. Y'all better help me. Maybe a half a second. Maybe a millisecond. Maybe a twinkle in an eye. And that's fast. But whatever it is, he said, he said, these light of fiction, watch what he said. It worketh for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In other words, whatever I'm going through, it is not going to work to my disadvantage, but it's just going to make my glory in better. I, because I got somewhere to go. Because heaven is my ultimate destination. Uh, for this we groan. To so be that being clothed upon, we should not be found naked. Don't be found naked. In other words, don't be caught with nowhere to go. Huh? Look at this. And, and, and he goes on. He's going to say that. He's the first confident. You must have confidence in, in, in about heaven. That's number one. You got to have confidence about heaven. Number two, he said, you got to have confidence about the inner resources. There's an inner resource. I, I don't care how difficult it is for you. Listen, here's what the Christian has. Verse 5. Now he that had wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also had given, somebody said given, unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Now watch this. He said, who made us for this Paradoxal life is God. God put us in this paradoxy. Now, don't go blaming God like Adam did. God, if you hadn't given me this woman, the paradox of life. That word wrought means that God made us for this self-same thing. Watch this. Who also, see, if you stop reading it, you will miss it. Who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Now, what did that mean? He said he made us, but he, watch what? He gave us a guaranteed ticket to heaven. He made us, but he made it possible that I can get to heaven and ain't nothing the devil in the hell can do about it. You know, well, I mean, you mean you're trying to say something like once saved, I'll say, yeah, if you're saved. 
Because the text, I ain't going to got time to go and prove all that, but you can go all back to Ephesians, you get chapter 1, and you start reading it down, and I can show you the illustration, and I can point it out. Blah, blah. But let's deal with the earnest. God sealed our, our salvation our, by the Holy Spirit. Watch this. You go buy a house, you put a down payment down, right? You go put it down there and you say, well, I'm going to buy this house. You got to put down $5,000, $10,000, whatever you're going to put down. Well, that's a contract. That's simply say that if you buy this house, you got to put this money down. Now, if you back out the deal, I have the right to keep the money. So God says to Satan, I'm going to guarantee his salvation. I don't care what he's suffering. I'm going to guarantee he's going to make it. And if, he, if, if I don't get him to heaven, that means you can own the Holy Spirit. Well, that's impossible. So I have to appreciate the inner resource. You can be encouraged because God has put in you courage and ability to, and capability of accomplishing anything that's within his will. I told the church this morning, Sunday school, you can be ambitious. You can achieve any goal you want to as long as you recognize who got you there. I'm going to have confidence. I have to utilize the internal resource. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to pick your head up. Stop worrying about stuff you can't change. Change the stuff you can and the wisdom to know the difference. Because some things you just can't change. And ain't no use you wasting your time with a whole lot of stuff that ain't going to change. You got to recognize the resource that you made. Look what, look what it said. He who made us is God. Watch this. He, now, he didn't made us as God. Who also had given us, given unto us the earnest of the spirit. God has given us the earnest of the first fruit of the spirit as a guarantee that we will be re-resurrected and put on immortality. That's why I always say I'm constantly becoming what I am. Got courage. And see, some people don't even know, well, I don't know where I'm saved or not. You saved? I don't know. I think so. You, Paul said, we know. You got to know. Don't be in that dilemma. If you ain't sure, make sure. The only way I can show you is by the word of God. That's the only thing that can do. Now, the rest of it is up to you and God and the Holy Spirit. And watch this. So he says, I have that, I have that confidence. I have confidence. If I'm going to get confidence, and I, I, got to, I have to have confidence about my deal with heaven. Secondly, I have to draw on the inner resource. God himself is preparing us for us for the experience, watch this, of putting on immortality. Do you know that? God is preparing you for the experience of putting on immortality. Because the tabernacle is going to dissolve. This body going back. You come from dust, you're going back to it. Like it or not, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. You ain't going to see it. And so God is, through the Spirit, His Holy Spirit teaching us how to wear immortality. And that's why you can't change in your, see, your flesh ain't going to change. But the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be the authenticity of that which is good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Isn't that good news? Come on, give God the hand for good news. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. 
And so he said he has given us the inner resources of his Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Confidence must also want to please Christ. This is the third mark. Look at verse 6 in that same text. Watch this. Therefore, whenever, whenever, whenever he says therefore, he's reaching back. It's a retroactive word. As a result of my, my confidence in heaven and a confidence in the inner resources I have, he said therefore. What would that mean? Is that He said we are always confident knowing that while we are at home uh, in the body, we are absent from the Lord, but we walk by faith and not by sight. What he's saying here is that, that my preparation for serving and pleasing God, it means that I don't become anxious when I, uh, uh, let me see how I can say that. I don't. I'm not to be anxious by worrying about missing heaven. I'm not to be anxious about worrying, not being able to perform to the expectation of Christ. Why? Because I got confidence in what God has done. I got confidence in what he is doing. But watch what he say. He said, I walk by faith. In other words, why would he bring that out? He said, because a walk of faith it's what really pleased God. If you, if, if you give me about, about 15 more minutes and don't go to sleep, I see your eyelids getting heavy. I can see your eyelids. I saw it. He said, when I walk by faith, I don't pay attention to my struggle. I don't allow my struggles to pull me from my destiny. When I walk by faith, I don't look at the situation because I've already saw that whatever I see is only temporary. When I walk by faith, I have hope in the unseen. God, I feel like running up in here. He said, I got my eyes fixed on what God has already prepared for me. I don't pay attention to the pain and think the pain is my limitation. I don't pay attention to the suffering and think the suffering is my limitation. The reality of pain is pain do hurt. The reality of suffering is suffering is real. But I cannot look at my suffering and my pain and my difficulty. I can't pay attention to my bank account and think that's life or death. Y'all ain't talking to me. And even if it meant life or death, I still have courage that it's going to be all right. I don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean to impose upon you, but I come to tell you that somewhere along this life, you got to know that God is on your side. Yes, yes. And whatever God is working in you, he's doing it for his own purpose. It, it could, could mean that he's trying to show somebody else how to suffer, but how the fact they're going to come out on the other side in the end. There could be somebody here who have gone through more suffering and pain than somebody else. But you could be an encouragement to know, to tell somebody God will make a way. You can help somebody alone to tell him he'll feed you when you're hungry. He'll put shelter over your head in the midst of a stormy night. He will be a doctor in a sick room. Is there anybody here? He'll be a lawyer in a courtroom. He'll get you out of jail even though you've been sentenced to life. Is there anybody here that know he's ill? You got to have confidence in who God is. Now watch what he said. He said, therefore, he said, therefore, he said, therefore, he said, we are always confident. We walk by faith and not by sight. Because everything you see is not necessarily what it is. 
The grass is not always greener on the other side. It's a mirage. My last point is that you have to uh, be willing to please Christ. Look at verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now watch this, verse 9. Wherefore, look here, because I got the confidence of what no matter what I'm going through, I am not going to shun my labor, my work, my ministry, my service, my, for Christ, I cannot walk away. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Tell you something, it ain't no promise that I'm going to see tomorrow, but I want to live so God can say, well done, if I die 10 seconds from now. I want to hear him say, servant of God, well done, you've been faithful of a few things, enter into the joy of the Lord. Can I get a witness in here? I want to live so God can use me anytime and anywhere and so he says and I conclude in a hurry he says wherefore we labor that whether present or out we may be accepted of him see it don't matter what nobody else thinks about the authenticity of your service. I, I, somebody sent me a phrase the other day, and I got to share it because I plan to put it on my wall. When people don't know you and want to know you, they speculate. When they think they know you, they fabricate. In other words, they make up stuff. But when they come to know you, they hate you. Because you ain't what they thought you were. Paul said, absent of presence. Not my intent is not to impress you. Your intent should not to be impressing me. But we are to labor together for the sake of the ministry of Christ. And I'm going to my seat because when we find that confidence is the courage to do what God uh, has called us to do. God has a house for me and you. And that confidence is that uh, it will have no flaws. God puts his spirit in me and in you. It is a divine deposit. And the reason why it's divine, because if it's left up to you to give it to me, you'll give it based on how well you like me. But I'm glad I can have courage because I have confidence that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died, I wish I had somebody, he died on Calvary. And the reason why I got confidence now is because when he died on the cross, he paid my sin paths and paid my sin present and paid my sin future. So what I'm trying to say that if he stayed dead, 
I would not have had any confidence in heaven. If he had stayed dead, I would not have had any resources to pull upon. If he had stayed dead, I would have given up church membership a long time ago. But since he didn't stay dead, he got up early Sunday morning and I got confident that heaven is a guaranteed journey. I got confident that I can call him when I need him. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. And I got confidence. Seeing then we have this ministry. I can't give up. I can't quit. I can't stop until he come. Because she said, occupy until I come. I wish I had somebody that can tackle their courage. No matter what the devil throw at you, you got to be able to face it head on. If God, I'm going to my seat. If God be for you, who shall be against you? Say, aren't you glad that God is for you? Aren't you glad that you got a place to go? Aren't you glad that I, I can be satisfied for me to live? Is Christ, and if I die, it's my gain. Say yeah.